This Week in the Boardroom, brought to you by Corporate Board Member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partner, the Center for Audit Quality, and contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals. Welcome to this edition of This Week in the Boardroom. I'm T.K. Kerstetter with Corporate Board Member, and we have a, a recurring guest that it's a pleasure to have back again. I'd like to introduce Walter Ricciardi, from, partner with Paul Weiss. And Walter is the former deputy director of the Division of Enforcement for the SEC. And uh, it is a pleasure to have you back again. Thank you, TK. It's a pleasure to be back. Well, we're going to be tackling, when you're here, we always tackle good topics. And in this time, we're going to tackle one that I don't think we've ever really talked about on the show before, and that's insider trading. And we really want to sort of pigeonhole this to the board, um, even though it certainly affects um, senior offices as well. But um, why don't we start by sort of identifying what insider trading is and why it's such a big issue? Let's talk about the two different types of insider trading. Classical insider trading is where someone who's an insider at the company, such as a board member, an officer of the company, or an employee of the company, trades in the company's stock while in possession of material, non-public information. That's a crime, and it's a violation of the securities laws. If they have that information, the company has to either disclose it before they trade, or they have to refrain from trading. That's the choice. Misappropriation is the second theory, classical the first, misappropriation the second, and that's where an outsider outside the company, let's say someone who runs a hedge fund, is tipped by someone who's inside the company. So the insider hears about the material non-public information, contacts the person outside the company, and the person outside the company, like the hedge fund person who runs a hedge fund, he knew or should have known that that information is being provided in breach of a duty of confidentiality. And if that person trades at the hedge fund, they've now committed insider trading, criminal act, violation of the securities laws, because they've traded while in possession of material non-public information that they got from someone who gave it to them in breach of a duty of confidentiality. So those are basically the two forms of insider trading. And just so we can make sure that this is clear to our audience, I'm sitting on a board. Right. We announce our earnings on a quarterly basis, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, after the first month, I get the first month's report on the company's performance on how, say, July did. Correct. At that moment in time, okay, I am in possession as a, as a board member of insider information that is not available to the public. Correct. So that would launch me into the situation of either disclosing or refraining, correct? correct? If the company has not disclosed that information publicly so that investors don't know it, and it's material, non-public information, and all material is is information that a reasonable investor would find important to a trade, so it's going to affect the stock price, uh, then that, that board member trades while in possession of that information, it would be a violation. Okay. I just want to make sure that we make that clear to our audience. It's that simple. Yes. Um, it seems like the SEC has really picked up their um, uh, focus, um, sort of have uh, enhanced surveillance these days. Right. We've seen some high-profile cases relative to that. Is, is that a fact? Is there, is there special focus on insider trading right now? Yes, TK, there is. And it's not just the SEC. Remember, the SEC only brings civil charges so they can fine you and enjoin you. They can't put you in jail. It's also the U.S. Attorney's Offices, which are part of the Department of Justice, who have the ability to put people in jail. There have been over 60 cases where people have been criminally indicted just in the Southern District of New York in Manhattan recently, this latest wave of insider trading cases. So there's a big wave of insider trading cases. And you're right, it does come from, I believe, this enhanced surveillance. There's been rumors forever that there's a lot of insider trading that's going on, and the government just can't detect it. And now they have very sophisticated computer algorithms to study trading patterns and to pick out seeing who trades before there is an announcement that has a major impact on the stock price, seeing who was doing that trading and finding patterns across different securities, different industries. And so they find suspicious trading and then they go back to good old fashioned detective work, 
which is building a bridge between the insiders who had access to the information and the people who trade and figuring out, aha, there is a relationship between those two. They went to the same golf club. They, they hang around together. They, there's phone calls between them. And they build a bridge between the person with the insider information and the person who traded. And then they are able to, uh, a second big development is using much more aggressive techniques for getting cooperation and getting to the evidence, as we saw in the Raj Rajaratnam case recently, using uh, where they take phones and, and listen in on phone calls, which is a, a big development. You didn't see that in insider trading and securities laws cases, getting phone taps. You saw that more in, in organized crime type cases where the criminal investigators would use things like phone taps. In the Raj case, they actually went to court and obtained the authority to listen in on people's phone calls and tape record those, and that became very strong evidence against uh, Raj Rat and his trial. And they also just use circumstantial evidence in some of the cases, which is just saying, hey, you went to a board meeting, you heard this information, a minute later, the phone records show that you made a phone call. We don't have a recording of that phone call, but we saw that circumstantial evidence that that person you made the phone call to soon after bought the stock. And circumstantially, a jury is able to infer that a tip occurred and the trader and the insider, who didn't trade at all, the insider didn't tra trade, but he tipped the outsider and the insider can also be convicted for providing that information to the, to the third party who mm -hmm. trades. Before my uh, corporate board member days serving on a public board, um, I always seem, they always seem to have what they called the sort of safe, safe harbor window that directors could look at. You know, several days after announcing the earnings right. and before you got sort of the next monthly report on things, there was a period of like 10 days mm -hmm. where we used to be told that that was sort of a safe harbor. That was only a safe harbor if we weren't in the middle of a of a uh, M&A transaction or some other, you know, insider information that I have. Right. But is that still the case that there that that's typically the period that that people look at to be able to buy and sell the company stock? Well, I think most companies have someone in the company, such as the general counsel, responsible for opening the trading window and closing the trading window. But that means that when the trading window is closed, period, no questions answered, you cannot trade. The trading window is closed. You cannot trade. You can't get permission to trade. When the clo when the trading window is open, it means you may be able to trade, but what you want to do is check and make sure you're still not in possession of material non-public information because if you are, even if the trading window is open, you still can't trade. Right. But it does signal that you may be able to trade because the trading window is open. Remember, uh, in terms of the duty to keep confidentiality and not tip someone, even though you're not trading, don't forget the board member has a very important obligation to keep those secrets and can get in a lot of trouble if they go play golf that afternoon and mention some big news to a friend on the golf course who then trades. That, that board member could be in as much trouble as the person who trades because they've provided the tip. Right. So what kind of, knowing this and us setting the stage, what kind of policies or procedures should companies have? You made reference to Right. the GC or this person that sort of mm -hmm. uh, monitors that. Um, is there anything else special that a company should have in place? Yeah. As part of the ethics policy, you want an insider trading policy, reminding people of their obligations to maintain confidentiality and to, to follow the proper process for deciding whether to buy or sell stock and getting permission to do that. You also want training. They should, companies should train people including board members, on the rules of the road with regard to insider trading so that there's no misunderstanding about the obligations, especially with this enhanced focus on enforcing the laws against insider trading. You want to make sure everyone understands how they can get in trouble and how to avoid trouble. Yeah, I would think that in one's orientation program as a director or as a senior officer, one of the key things that should be part of that orientation program is making sure that everybody is aware and, and signing off in the, either in their ethics policy or their trading policy or whatever right. that, yes, I am, I've been shown this policy and I'm aware that it exists. So. Right. Um, what advice would you give directors um, to make sure that they keep their nose clean in this insider trading? Yeah, number one, maintain confidentiality. So to the extent you're given information at the board, meetings, make sure that you're not passing that outside the company. There's also a thing called Reg FD, 
where if a company provides information to select people, it's also a violation, even if it's not for purpose of tipping someone, right. could also create a problem. So m very important to maintain confidentiality. Second is to consult. If you're going to be trading, uh, don't just say, well, the window's open, I can go ahead and, and buy or sell. Go to the general counsel, go to the person designated within, within the company's policy, get advice that you're okay with trading, and think carefully about, am I in possession of material non-public information? You may want to even obtain your own legal counsel before and lay out all the things you think you know and, and make sure that you have received advice that what you know is, is not going to prohibit you from trading. And the other thing is, keep in mind there's a, a rule on 10b-5-1 plans. Now, what that provides is that if you're not in possession of material non-public information, you can create a 10b-5-1 plan at that time, which sets forth that you will sell stock or buy stock sometime in the future. And you can set it up where, let's say, you have a, a block of stock that you want to sell over the next five years to diversify. You can put in that plan exactly when you plan to sell that. If you set up the plan when you're not in possession of material non-public information, you can then go ahead with those sales even though you later become in possession of material non-public information because you set it up earlier when you didn't have that information, there's a safe harbor for selling within that plan if no matter what you learn later, you're scheduled to sell, you can sell and not have any issue. But the key to that plan is you must follow the plan then. You can't, you can't renege because no. the market moves away from you or something happens. Correct. The 10B plan says whatever the environment is at the time, I still have to go ahead and and execute that, that transaction okay. when I said I'm going to do it. You could imagine that uh, you set it up to sell next Monday and you're told over the weekend, oh, we're about to be acquired, the stock is going to rocket. And you say, you know what, I'll cancel my 10B51 plan tonight. Not a good thing to do. Yeah. That'd be a problem. It's interesting. We just saw a case of that actually in the Facebook, the, one of their uh, lead directors um, who had some 30, 40 million, uh, million shares had sent up a t uh, 10 B um, 5, 10 B 5, 5, one. five one plan. Right. And uh, that was, he sold a bulk of the stock. So he was taking, he did exactly what you said during a sane time uh, right. when he didn't have information, set that up. And subsequently, everybody's been criticizing mm -hmm. that director for the sale, but they had thought this through a long time ago. Yeah. The, the whole notion behind a 10B51 plan is that you've determined to make that sale at an earlier date, and so the developments that occurred from the date that you decide to set up that plan and the date that you actually execute the sale did not have any impact, could not have had any impact on that decision to sell. So it really shouldn't be inferred that a sale in accordance with the 10B51 plan is saying anything about the current activities going on at the company. That decision to sell was decided the day they implemented the 10B51 plan. Well, um, Walter, I hope that in the course of this show that we have saved X number of people out there any embarrassment or challenge uh, knowing how serious and how active this insider trading uh, enforcement has been. So I really appreciate the time you took to come in and lay the groundwork for uh, communicating this important message. And My pleasure, TK. It's a pleasure to have you. And that will conclude this edition of the um, This Week in the Boardroom. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week where we'll take a look at another critical topic that will help you be a better board member or committee member. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next week for This Week in the Boardroom, brought to you by corporate board member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partner, the Center for Audit Quality, and contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals.